Hey Juan, I just want you to know that I um, put on my, when I did the video with, uh, for VSBA, I, they cut this part, but what I, um, what I learned from you was really how early Thursday night football is. <laughs> I was like, we got to get out by then. <laughs> it's tonight too, right? They have a game tonight. <laughs> yes. Who's playing oh, tonight? Yeah. I, mean, I didn't realize that was tonight. Nice yeah. tonight. <laughs> It'd probably be the first time since I've become chair. <laughs> Feels like we had a lot of long meetings lately. Yes, yes. Did I miss the conversation about the three o'clock Steelers game yesterday? <laughs> I couldn't even try to make that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the earliest that I've ever heard of. Football. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I walked in my house and it was on. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> All right, Gertrude, I like the reindeer. <laughs> that's cute. I do too. I, I, I took it off. You know, I love the reindeer. You know, I know. Jenny has a really cute reindeer garland in her uh, work area. Yeah, she I sent me a picture. Have given it to us. Yeah, she, she did it good. And Kim sent me a picture. Yeah, they both did. <laughs> I told Jenny to. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, but Jenny told me you told her Beth, and then Kim Kim sent it. Yeah, too. So Ms. Torres, there actually is not a game tonight because of uh, the COVID outbreak that had happened with the Ravens. Oh. They were supposed to play the Cowboys tonight, but they moved that game to um, Tuesday night of next week because they wouldn't be able to play back-to-back. -back. So there's actually not a game tonight. I see. Gotcha. So Maybe we got we lots of time. We just have our evening free. No, no, we don't have lots of time. No, no, no. That's not uh, <laughs> Dr. Hubbard. Those are things that you keep to yourself. <laughs> oh, I was I looking at her. <laughs> There's a lot of college basketball on the night. There's, um, yeah, there's yeah. Isn't the last one right on today? The there's, there's plenty of sports that you can look at tonight. Game, there's Dr. a game that starts at 6 o'clock. <laughs> we'll see what we can do, Dr. Hubbard. I never would have thought that of you, son. I mean, you let me down. You let me I'm down, sorry. Dr. Hubbard. I, I'm always going to be honest. I'm sorry. Tuesday is such a weird time to have a football game, but okay. It doesn't matter. It's not your team, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Fair. I just like, well, I like having football on in the background. Strange. <laughs> just sleep too. <laughs> okay. Are we almost done? <laughs> oh, good. One minute. How about that? One thing I'm missing, Julia, is the agenda. Hello. Hi, Miss Bryant. How are you doing? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order um, at this time. Get a moment of silence in. Oh my gosh, it's going to confuse me so much not to have the agenda in front of me. Um, so we'll go ahead and do the moment of silence at this moment. Okay, thank you all for indulging me on that. Um, we'll go ahead and do the roll call now of board members. Yes, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Bryant. Here. Ms. Bryant and Morseberger. It's real hard to hear you, Ms. Green. Ms. Bryce and Morseberger. Thank you. Here. Dr. Kraft. Here. Ms. McKeever. Here. Ms. Perrier. Here. 
Ms. Torres. Yes. Mr. Wade. Yes. And Ms. Adiba Carardi. Okay, great. So we have the proposed agenda in front of us. Are there um, any comments or questions on that? Okay. Any? Move for approval. Okay. Second. Uh, any comments or questions? Okay, so go ahead, um, Ms. Green, with the vote on that. We'll go ahead and vote. Okay. Madam Chair, Mr. Bryant. Yes. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. Mr. Wayne? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, y'all. Um, we have the agenda, the uh, personnel, I'm sorry, the consent agenda. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, any action we want to take? I move we approve the consent agenda. No, second. Great. Um, any further discussion? And go ahead and do the roll one more time on that vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yep. Ms. Perrier? Yes. Ms. Torres? Sorry, yes. <laughs> Mr. Wade? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you all. Um, appreciate it. And now, um, did I, I, I just skip the comments from members? You guys need to keep me up to whatever. I guess it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but we're already done with the consent agenda, so that's good. I also want to note that today is December 3rd, um, 2020, and that is if um, that is our, and today is our regular school board meeting. I just didn't say it at the beginning of the meeting. Hopefully, we'll have a chair next time who will remember to do that for you guys. Um, anyway, then, uh, so we're going to do comments from members of the public. The school board, Charlottesville City School Board, uh, welcomes comments from members of the community. Uh, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes um, and state your name and address for the record when you are introduced. We have some people signed up and what Mr. Cuomo likes is if you can raise your hand and um, or send a message through the chat if you would like to comment, um, just to indicate that you would like the, to comment. So. He, I'm going to go ahead and ask Mr. Cuomo now to tell us if there's anybody waiting to comment. Sure. We have uh, just several people in the gallery as an attendee, but um, at this time, I do not see any hands raised um, and I don't see any chat comments asking to, uh, to speak publicly. Okay, great. Now is your time if you would like to um, make a comment, now's the time to do so. So feel free to raise your hand in the public, I'm sorry, in the chat feature, or just raise your hand on the Zoom call. I'll give you a few more minutes, or I'm sorry, a couple more seconds. Next time I'm gonna do um, music interlude. Um, I keep warning you guys that. Okay. Nobody, yeah. Mr. Cuomo? There is nobody at this time who has uh, indicated on chat or has raised their hand as an attendee to comment at this time. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and close public comment for this portion of the meeting. We do have a second portion of the meeting where we do um, have public comment. At the end, we also ask that you send us an email if you have a comment. Um, you can do that at schoolboard at charlottesvilleschools.org. And um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the 21-22 program of study. I think, yeah. Who's that? 
Dr. Atkins, do you want to introduce that? It's me, and I needed to, and, unless Dr. Atkins, you wanted to say something, but I had to. I'll do a quick introduction, Dr. <laughs> Odie, and then you can get started. And we okay. have our principals here, um, Madam Chair, and school board members. Each year, we bring to you the program of study to give you an overview of any additions that we have made to the course selections or the uh, type of courses that we're going to offer. So we'd like to present to you now the tro uh, program of study for the 2021-22 uh, school year. Dr. Odie. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Atkins, good evening again. Uh, as Dr. Atkins stated, uh, we do have staff here tonight that will present to you our 21-22 program of study. Uh, Dr. Adam Hastings will start the presentation and we'll move then to Sita Delorier, who is one of our Buford a assistant principals presenting for Dr. Turner. And then on to Dr. Eric Irizarry for CHS and finally Stephanie Carter for KTech. Dr. Hastings. Well, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and we can go right on into the first or rather to the next slide. And I think I have the easiest one because here at Walker this year, we have no proposed changes to the program of study. And I'm happy to turn it over to Mr. Laurier at Buford. While Ms. Laurier is coming up, thank you so much for being here for Dr. Turner. And um, Ms. Pam Davis is also here to give support um, to the presentation. So thank you both for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Thank you, Dr. Eddie. Madam Chair and board members, Dr. Atkins, thank you for having us tonight. I'd like to share with you additions, removals, and general changes that we're proposing to our program of study for Beaufort Middle School. We'd like to start with the removal of the honors designation for high school credit courses. Um, as we continue to create opportunities and access for all of our students, we want to be sure that the program language is clear. Um, courses such as Algebra 1, Geometry, Spanish 1 and 2, French 1 and 2, Latin 1 and 2, and Engineering Explorations 1 are unleveled. As such, upon successful completion of the course, students will have earned a high school credit. We'd also like to remove Spanish 2, Part 2. This year marks the final cohort of students who have taken the Spanish 1 course at the upper elementary school for high school credit. The Spanish 2, Part 2 course is no longer necessary as its complement. Earth Science. <clears throat> Instead of the Earth Science standards, and because of the, the division has realigned the scope and sequence of the SOLs, Students will take the eighth grade SOL in eighth grade. Moving on, we propose that we remove Family Consumer Science 1 and 2, as well as the Independent Living course. Um, we're eliminating Family Consumer 1 and 2 and the Independent Cor Living course. There are no subsequent, I'm sorry, there are no subsequent courses at the high school. However, an 18 week course in urban farming would serve as an introductory and complementary course to the high school's elective offerings. Based on current and historical student elective interest surveys, urban farming is a highly requested course. Could you please go on to the next slide? Thank you. We would like to add life science. This is a course directly aligned with the scope and sequence and the standards of learning. Um, neither earth science nor life science were captured accurately in the 2021 program of study for Buford. Could you move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay. So we'd like to add um, the following as an exploratory um, rotation to our rotations. That would include middle school exploratory dramatics. It's essentially a drama class for middle school students. N next slide, please. Journalism. Next slide, please. Your book. And as I've already mentioned, intro to urban farming. 
Um, these again, all are additions to our exploratory rotation. Um, they would also serve as a clear pathway uh, to the connections uh, that uh, high, the high school currently offers in the way of their exploratories and allowing students to continue their interest. Uh, finally, we'd like to collapse our Algebra 1-7 and Algebra 1-A class to form Algebra 1. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Irizarry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, at this point, I will uh, talk about Lugo McGinnis. They are very quick as well. Uh, LMA is, um, they are not doing any changes to their program of study this year. We have some exciting uh, additions to our uh, program of study this year. Uh, you know, we're proud to announce we're in the process right now um, of establishing uh, officially a partnership with Virginia State University. And um, let me move, sorry, on my Zoom screen, you guys are on my slide there. Let me slide over there. There we go. Uh, so in partnership with VSU, we're going to be offering a rising stars program for students that are interested in going into the teaching profession. Um, the rising stars program um, is going to be a dual enrollment program in the CTE, uh, in our CTE programming. And the pathway will consist of classes that prepare students to enter the field of education. And they'll be completing VSU's Foundation of Education 1 and 2 courses while at high school. So this is a unique partnership for us. Most of our dual enrollment courses here are through uh, Piedmont. And this will be a unique partnership with us and Virginia State University. And additionally, the uh, qualified students in this program may also be eligible for Virginia State University's guaranteed admissions program to VSU and also have access to the possibility of uh, college scholarships, including some um, very big scholarships attached to this partnership. So we're excited with uh, bringing up uh, aboard VSU to, to our CHS family and vice versa. And uh, it's going to be a way for us to allow students that are interested in education to get some real world experiences here while they're in high school, also earn dual enrollment credit, which we will know will count towards their um, their basic studies at VSU or at another state school if they decide to go in that direction as well. And um, it will also be an opportunity for us to hopefully uh, grow some of our own teachers and bring them back to uh, the CCS school district. And um, we're very excited about it. So if we go to the next slide, we already um, approved last year uh, Virginia Teachers for Tomorrow. So what we're requesting from the school board is to move the Virginia Teachers for Tomorrow 1 to a dual enrollment. And we're going to add the dual enrollment Virginia for Tomorrow's uh, Teachers for Tomorrow 2. And this will allow a pathway starting in the 11th grade into their senior year for students to um, receive those two dual enrollment classes that will receive their high school credit, uh, a CTE completer, and also their um, up to um, at least six CTE or uh, college credits, excuse me, from Virginia State University that will be on their college transcript. And that could be in addition to any other dual enrollment courses they're taking here at Charlottesville High School. And next slide. And then we're continuing to uh, work with uh, the VDOE uh, as we presented earlier this year. We are one of a, few, a handful of school divisions that is piloting uh, African American histories, um, and that's in partnership with the WHDO and VDOE. So what that means is uh, Tim Johnson, our uh, African American histories teacher, along with Pam Brown, who collabs in that class, uh, they're getting additional support in uh, African American history, specifically looking at inquiry-based learning. And really, this builds on our changing the narrative and focus, focusing on local history as well. So what we're proposing is continuing with this um, and making African-American history. Um, last year, it was honors option, but we want to go ahead and just make that a full honors class this year. And I believe that's it. So I'll turn it over if uh, Stephanie Carter is here. Hi, good evening, everybody. At KTech, we also have minimal changes this year. We do have a, our current listing of classes is the same that you can see on this slide. On this slide, um, 
The only request on the next, if somebody could forward the next slide, please, is that we are going to remove computer network hardware um, using five years of historic of data does not support the program remaining at KTech and the resources that are put toward it. Um, enrollment doesn't support, didn't support it this year. And the trend does not show that it should increase. Um, we are asking the board to support our offering an integrated government and English 12 course. One of our main goals at KTech always is to reduce access, uh, reduce barriers to access um, and schedule is one of the ways that we address that. Um, our students would be able to take a government and English 12 course that are two um, senior required courses for graduation. And that really opens up their schedule to be able to access a K-Tech class. And those are our only changes. Any closing thoughts, Dr. Odie, before we turn it over to the board? Uh no, I thank, I thank our administrators for uh, those great presentations. Uh, very clear and concise and uh, a clear understanding of what those changes would be or lack of changes as is in Walker's case. Uh, at this time, we will uh, ask for questions from the board. And, and uh, Madam Chair, just before you, um, the board asks questions, I want one clarification in the honors um, class uh, we are continuing what the um, progress that we have made at Walker Upper Elementary School in having honors option and having the rigor of honors rather than having a standalone class in honors. So the students who are leaving Walker coming up to Beaufort will continue to matriculate at the same level of rigor as uh, in an honors class without a designation and a set aside class for honors. And I, I, Dr. Hastings is here and he can help us um, answer any questions that you might have uh, but about that continuation, that continuum that we're creating between Walker, Buford, and the high school. Who would like to go first? Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I just had a, um, Madam Chair, I, I had a quick question. Um, so I just wanted to know from the various principals um, and administrators if the schedule this year seemed like it was very little changes. Was that with done with the notion that, you know, um, with the COVID-19 and the schedule and the hybrid and things like that going on, or it probably wouldn't have been any, you know, this probably would have been the same recommendations if it had been regular schedule. Um, does that make sense? Mr. Wade, I think it's more a reflection of, of alignment across the three schools. Um, we've uh, we've we've been in place for a while now as an administrative team, and we've been working over the last uh, few years in my case, and more so in Dr. Ayers' areas, but uh, to really have an aligned program of study. And we're at a point now at Walker where, as you know, our big efforts were about unleveling, and we're at a point now where we're very happy with the program offerings that we have. Um, and and I I think we're 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 moving into steady waters, looking at it from a fifth grade, sixth grade continuum. Not that there isn't always an exploration yeah. for, for newer things, but no, I, I think this, uh, speaking from, from Walker, and I'm, I'm fairly certain from the Buford standpoint, I don't, I don't believe we would have offered any other changes if we were in a non-pandemic year. And I can piggyback on that. Uh, at the high school, we've worked in the past four years to really build out a lot of our CTE, pa uh, CTE pathways and make sure we have a wide range of classes. This is you know, I, I think we would have gone forward with, with the same schedule, COVID or no COVID. Uh, we really just wanted to focus on uh, continuing to increase the rigor and strengthen the programs that we already have. I think we're in a really good position right now. I would I would agree um, the, that the pandemic had no impact on our course selection in terms of removal or adding. Okay. Is that any other questions? Okay. No. Okay. Craft. Um, yeah, just a quick question for Dr. Irizarry. Um, I'm excited to hear about the uh, VSU partnership and wondering if you could just um, tell us a little bit more about the guaranteed admission um, and what that, what that is. Is that a guaranteed admission for a four-year degree there? It is. We're currently uh, finalizing the MOU, but VSU does through this program, and there are other school districts that have a um, similar program. And what would happen is for qualified students who uh, matriculate through the program, 
they would be eligible to uh, for number one for guaranteed admissions if they meet the BSU um, admissions requirements and the requirements set forth in the MOU. Um, and then there there could be the possibility of some scholarships on top of that as well. But it is a guaranteed admissions to uh, Virginia State University um, for qualified students um, that 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 meet those qualifications, I should say. And I I will add to that that we are working with VSU to tuition would be guaranteed for those students uh, that uh, complete this program. Uh, also, we are working on the possibility of room and board uh, with, the, with the university. That's not a guarantee that both of those would be um, guaranteed, but we're working really hard with uh, VSU to be able to provide the best opportunity for the students that matric matriculate through this program to have as as uh, free of an, of an education as they can through VSU. Well, this is a big deal. That's really exciting. Um, I'm wonderful. so happy to hear about that. Thank you. Dr. Irizarry, can you tell me how many people were um, enrolled in the teacher one, two thing this year? We had no enrollment this year. This is the second, we're adding to the course this year. So this is going to be a new, this is going to be a dual enrollment course. So we're going to work on our recruitment this, um, this well, once it's approved, we're going to work on uh, recruitment this spring. But we um, did have the non-dual enrollment class. We did have the non-dual enrollment. What we didn't have and what this partnership, how this will strengthen the pathway is that there was, there was not really that incentive that cared at the end there to really entice a lot of students to go into just a, just a regular, you know, teach for, teach for tomorrow CTE program. Um, so what we really wanted to do is create a, a true CTE pathway. And th what this will do, this will create really the, um, the class and also the, the, the intern, some internship components. And then at the end of the day, they will earn that dual enrollment credit, which will be, I think will broaden the, the appeal for the class and then having VSU as a partner. And it's not that VSU will just stay there and wait for our students. There's actually, this program actually has VHU come to Charlottesville High School. They will help with the recruiting process. They're going to provide those students with uh, experiential activities. Now we'll see what that looks like with COVID. We'll, we'll make it happen, but you know, it'll be a little different. But traditionally those include college tours and they really become a partner with the school district. And it really, they follow them for those two years. And so that way they build relationships. And when they get to VSU, they feel like they're already part of that program if they choose to go to VSU. So, I think this is really bolstering, you know, what we were trying to do grassroots. I think it just helps to have a university partner that can help put some, um, you know, just some real, I don't know, real great things behind it. Um, so. Great, thanks. Yep. Bryson Morsberger. Uh, yes, I just have one quick question and I apologize, I'm not more up to date on it. But I remember last year when we were talking about the courses, we were talking about the the world language or the yeah the foreign language program at the middle school and I just wanted to know are, were the changes from last year continued this year like there was just an issue about students being able to continue taking uh, world languages through middle school like some drop off between elementary or upper elementary and middle school I think. So right now at Walker, we offer Spanish as an elective course. Um, some years ago, we offered Spanish for high school credit. So we um, we have an elective program at Walker. We have 229, I think, don't quote me on that, but that number is close. Students enrolled in Spanish this year at Walker and we will continue to offer it as an elective. Um, that the high school credit option is, is no longer available at Walker. Um, but, but, at, but as you saw tonight, there were some changes uh, for Buford. Um, I'm not, I don't think I'll let uh, Mr. Laurier talk about those. Yes. So the only changes um, with our world languages program is that we're removing the word honors from the verbiage. It's still a course. We've not changed uh, the description. It's just the students still receive a high school credit. We're just removing the word honors from the program of study. Uh, we have a, a number of students who are enrolled in Spanish 1, 2, Latin 1, 2, French 1, and 2. In fact, with our Latin class, um, we've had to uh, pay one of our teachers an additional um, salary because we our numbers are so high. So where our kids are rolling. Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay. I don't, Lisa and everybody else, you're not on my screen. So if you have want to say something, please do. All right. I'll jump in, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I will start with Dr. Irizarry, if I may, just for clarification. So the partnership with the Rising Stars program, is that different than the Virginia Teach for Tomorrow's dual enrollment courses? Are those different programs or is that a, a partnership between those now? Those are the, that is the partnership classes that are associated with uh, the VSU partnership. Does that, so um, the Virginia, the dual enrollment classes will align with their foundations of education one and two. Our Teach for Tomorrow one and two will align with those. So those will either be taught by a qualified um, a Charlottesville uh, high school teacher or possibly a Virginia, uh, a professor, you know, an adjunct from, or a professor from VSU, depending on, on what that looks like. But those will, those courses will be the same courses. They will get, so their college transcript will, will reflect foundation, foundations of education one and two. Their high school transcript will reflect uh, teachers for uh, tomorrow one and two, because those are the those are the dual courses, high school and the uh, college credits. Great, thank you. Um, and then quickly for Dr. Hastings. So are, are the, I was just curious about the engineering elective course. I just was, if you could give us a quick update on how that's going there. It's, it's <laughs> better than anyone could have possibly imagined. I don't know how else to say it. I, it's, uh, we had to switch gears a little bit, you know, in, in the face-to-face -face world, engineering looks more like robots and uh, and lights and connecting cables. And in the virtual world, it looks a lot more like computer programming and uh, simulations, but it's it's really been fantastic. Uh, the program continues. It, we've sustained that humongous enrollment. Um, so we're at, you know, about 225 kiddos in that program. And from all, uh, all data would suggest that kids are really loving it. So it's what I'm so appreciative. So is our school community that we were able to make that change and offer that to our kids because it's really been a fantastic game changer for our school. Great, thank you. So, and then um, taking that and transitioning to Buford. Yeah. So how is that going um, at Buford as far fantastic. as- Fantastic. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, what can we do to, I mean, do you guys need anything else to help support that program there? Well, we have, we hired a new exploratory um, teacher for the engineering program. Um, Dr. Mahoney, she's fantastic. Our enrollment is high. Uh, things are um, in the upswing. So the feeder pattern from Dr. Hastings and Walker um, is I think will really prove to help um, sustain our engineering program as students shift on from Buford to uh, CHS. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And then just a couple quick questions. I mean, the additions that you all have um, look great and exciting, um, but I was just curious um, about the decision-making and what went into or how you made the decisions to remove um, family consumer science one and two and independent living. If you could just share that, please. Yes, so we are really thinking about alignment with uh, BHS and we um, wanted to make sure that um, the pathway access, the segue points for um, students who are interested in the content would have um, um, something that they could carry over into at CHS. Um, urban farming is based on our surveys, student surveys and interests, is a highly requested course. Um, it's generally through city schoolyard garden, some component of it is offered um, now. Um, and because that plus the, um, the, the pathway piece with, the C, with CHS, we thought that urban farming would be um, a better selection. Okay. And then do those um, removals, I mean, is that impacting staffing at all or? So our consumer family um, science teacher is actually retiring at the end of this year. So we will still have the FTE for the urban farming. Okay, great. Thank you for everything. Thank you. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Bryan or Ms. Prayer. Yeah, I just had one question for Dr. Irizarry in regards to the, um, the uh, African-American History Honors class. 
Um, it's ex um, all the changes, especially the teacher ed program, I'm really excited about. But this particular class um, has special meaning because I was in the first group, the class of 1972, Lane High School, who petitioned the administration to, to offer a African-American history course. And um, in so doing, after a little protest, they did. So now it's come full circle to honors credit. And um, my concern is that um, what, what do we plan to do to, um, especially now they, they add in the local history, which is lots of good local history in Charlottesville. What's the plan going forward to recruit students to, to really take that class now that it's been designated um, if it's approved honors credit to get kids really excited about taking that class. Yeah, so the great thing is right now we are, we are, we're involved in that pilot and we're getting great feedback from the teachers and from the students. Um, I've got a meeting scheduled with uh, Dr. Douglas from the Jeff School for next week to continue changing the narrative as well, which is really tying, was really dovetailing well into this course. So I think that chatter is going to start naturally among the school. And of course, we're going to continue to recruit for that class too. The honors designation will really help because, um, you know, it was, we've kind of slowly moved up to that level. It was, you know, it was for just regular high school credit last year, it was honors option. And this year it's a full, it's a full honors credit. And I think what really is going to entice students to come into that class is the type of instruction they're doing. Um, it's, it's really focusing on those inquiry based projects, um, that local history, they can really get into, um, you know, we have such a rich local history here as well, where they can see the history and real, you know, and feel it and touch it and just get out into the community mm -hmm. and see how it impacts them, their families and our, in our community, even to this day. So, uh, we've got some great teachers there and, you know, we're going to work hard to make sure that uh, our families and our students are aware of the new designation and also what it looks like. And Tim's done a great, uh, sorry, Mr. Johnson's done a great job <laughs> with that class. And so has uh, Ms. Brown over the past two years, and they've been really invigorated by this new PL that they're getting from the state. So, uh, you know, we're, we're really optimistic about it. Yeah, I'm real excited. Thank you. Mr. Bryant, also the African-American uh, History Commission recommended to the State Board of Education that uh, an African-American history course be a requirement for graduation. Uh, and the State Board of Education uh, did approve that recommendation. So uh, they're in the process of writing guidance now, documents for us in order to implement that in our high schools. How exciting. So thank you for getting that started. Mm -hmm. Ms. Perrier, any comments? Um, I just wanted to um, add to Dr. Irizarry's comment, or Irizarry, I'm sorry, Eric, I get it wrong every time, um, but the changing the narrative portion with the uh, Jefferson School African American Heritage Center um, took off like gangbusters this summer. Our instructors uh, that participated uh, gained a lot from it. Um, we will at some point in the spring, um, I've heard, um, get a, a report or a presentation regarding that. And um, I appreciate Dr. Irizarry's uh, willingness to encourage everyone in the building um, to participate in this program. Uh, we've worked extremely hard with uh, Dr. Atkins's help uh, because she's our silent cheerleader and sometimes she's out front and we're following behind her to get this to happen. And um, I think we saw that last year with the marker that we put up at Johnson Elementary School. And we are doing a lot to bring our local history as it relates to African-Americans into the schools because we all need to know our history, whether you're from here or whether you're transplanted like myself. So to Dr. Atkins and Dr. Irizarry and Dr. Douglas, thank you for making sure that our students receive the type of history that we all need to have. Um, just to piggyback on that, I have, um, because you know my kids are at home, learning all of this, I really get to hear the, the the teachers teaching the subject and it has been um i just really appreciate it i'm really always happy to hear because it's just not like what my experience of learning social studies was and i i and they can see and touch and hear 
um, the the local history that their teachers are teaching them. And it really does have a meaningful connection to them. So I'm very grateful for that um, as well. Um, having said that, I always like to, you know, I always make a big fuss at program of study time. So this year's no different. Um, this is kind of the first time I read about what the changes would be. Um, and so I, cause I didn't get a chance in this early, you know, in the mid afternoon to look at the program and study. So I apologize. I just don't, I just have a lot of questions. One of the main questions I have is how we're going to pay for all of these changes. <laughs> um, is this a budget neutral program of study? Um, for example, like adding journalism and yearbook um, at the, at the, the Buford was something I was thinking like, well, I mean, if we had all the money in the world, that sounds great, but I'm not sure that that, that maybe this is the budget year to be you know, expanding our programming offerings in that way. Um, so especially if we could do, so can I just get a, some insight into the thinking about adding those two? And if this is a budget neutral decision or if there were other considerations I should be thinking about? Absolutely, Madam Chair. So um, two points. Um, the first is that I'd like to um, convey that our urban farming class will be a full year it's a year-long class, which will mean that as a CTE course, students are allowed to earn um, a high school credit for that course as well. Um, to answer your question and to your point, um, I'm going to invite my colleague Pam Davis, if it's okay with the board, to address. Thank you. To address um, your point, Ms. Davis, are you there? Ms. Davis, are you there? Okay, so um, rather I mean, wait, than I give can, you, I'm sorry. I can, go to the, I can go to the next subject if you want so that she, you know, we can give her time to, to respond. Okay. And I don't wanna, than, I, I'm sorry. And rather than pro provide you misinformation, let me, let me get back to you if that's okay. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, so. And, and um, Ms. McKeever, it is budget neutral. Those, those courses that have been added um, with us uh, taking out the family and consumer uh, affairs uh, course at the high school. Uh, we are replacing that with one of those courses that you've discussed, the urban farm, farming. And so that makes a um, complete alignment from the middle school into the high school. And it also will help students to uh, satisfy the career and technical education requirement, the uh, sequential requirement that they have in order to graduate. Um, Beth Baptist has been working with us to make sure that that alignment is there. So those changes will be budget neutral. Well, the I understand that the urban farming will be. That makes sense. That is not what the question I asked was about yearbook and um, journalism specifically. And, and Dr. Irizarry can talk with you, but that's also budget neutral. Um, I So, and then... Um, Again, I'd just like to understand a little bit more about why those classes versus other classes. Um, journalism, any journalist will tell you, <laughs> not don't go into it. It's like being a lawyer, don't do it. Um, and uh, if you wanna you know, have a life or get paid, um, those are just not good career pathways. Um, so as an exploratory, you know, sure you can have like a, a newspaper or you can have like a after school club, all of that. So I just don't, I'm a little concerned about the idea of a, you know, I don't know, is it a full year? Is it a half semester? Like, I, I feel like I don't have enough information in front of me. Again, my fault. I didn't look this afternoon about what the program of study said about those specific classes, but I, those are, those are concerns that I have about those specific classes. Um, and I wonder what we, I, and then the family and consumer science, again, one of my kids, took that class. Um, of course, I'm very nostalgic about it. Everybody kind of is like, why do we get rid of family life, right? Like, or family, whatever, home ec, we got rid of home ec and like the world fell apart, right? So this is like what home ec is now called family consumer science. So um, there are some real significant life skills you can learn in that class that I'm afraid we're going to lose with urban farming, not to suggest that we don't do it. Um, but I, I think you know, I would rather add a unit of or a half a semester of urban farming to a family consumer uh, science. So what was the thinking about that? 
I mean, I understand alignment, but why do you need a year long class on farming when you could also be learning other skills? Like, I don't know, again, one child of mine has so far taken it and she gained, she gained a lot from it. <laughs> Madam, Madam chairperson, cha Madam chair, sorry. I'm still, I'm new at this. Same. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Really great. <laughs> I really feel bad putting you on the spot. Um, no, no, it's okay. I, yeah, and I, I, can only, I can offer you what I know. Okay. And what I know um, is not misinformation, but it may be limited. Okay. Um, so it is salary neutral. Um, journalism yearbook, a new, new, those courses would be taught by English teachers who we already have here at Buford. So um, it's a matter of um, extending a section to teachers who um, are already employed by CCS. Uh, we chose those courses specifically. Um, we are really struggling with, not struggling, we're working to overcome our accreditation, um, which is accredited, we're accredited with conditions. So we thought that by having something that was academically focused around the components of English and writing, reading and writing, that would further underscore um, our focus of academic rigor. Wow, Based that's a really good reason. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you for being gracious. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. McKeever, one of the other areas that we, we have to address is um, as we students are leaving Buford, going to the high school, um, making sure that they are well prepared for essay writing when they get into high school whether that be in uh, ninth, 10th, 11th or 12th grade. I was meeting with a group of students um, this week and one of the things that they felt like they needed more of what were opportunities for writing. Um, Dr. Irizarry does a great job uh, at the high school making sure his students are engaged, but most of the essay writing comes through the dual enrollment courses or the advanced placement courses. So this is a way for us to get um, students engaged in meaningful writing, uh, starting in the middle school and continuing on into the high school. And it would be whether or not, irregardless of whether they take the DE classes or the AP classes, they will still be involved in rigorous writing. And those, those classes will also dovetail very well. We have got, you know, we've got a lot of writing options. It's not just journalism. We have KTR, we have yearbook, but we also have creative writing as well. So, you know, I think it will be a good springboard and a pathway for students that are interested in writing to really build those those skills at Buford and transfer those over. Same thing with theater as well. You know, one of the reasons, um, you know, engineering is so strong at, at the high school um, orchestra is because there's, you know, they have a foothold in the lower grades as well. So that'll give another foothold in some areas that we traditionally have not had um, a, a theater pattern into. So hopefully, um, you know, we can increase some of those opportunities for our students as well. I also want to suggest two things like, well, one thing really is public speaking um, is also heavy yeah. writing. I mean, you have to write in order to be effective public speaker. Um, and um, I think, you know, VHSL has forensics as one of their, you know, sports. <laughs> so it's just something also another way to engage students. I think that maybe we're um, missing out on uh, in the lower grades. I think um, if we had public speaking earlier as well as offered in the high school, that might be a pathway as well. Not a pathway, but just like an offering that might get people to understand about persuasive writing and about writing in general. So I think that's great. I'm, I mean, I'm much more excited about journalism than yearbook, but um, I hope you do get the kids who could really benefit and you have a a, a focus of journalism that is incredibly broad as journalism really means so much right now. And I just feel like to do it justice, it cannot be like old school. It's gotta be like really modern. Madam Chair, might I also add um, that with our family consumer science and independent living courses, our numbers have been low in terms of enrollment recently. So. That's, that also factors. Yeah, I was going to ask that. And with the retirement, it makes a lot more sense um, to trans transition. But again, like, and I'm, you know, I, everybody loves the garden. Urban farming at the high school is a great, I want to continue that. I love the idea mm -hmm. of the pathway, but I don't want to lose sight of sowing 
and <laughs> cooking, taking care of yourself mm -hmm. uh, as like a, as a, you know, if we're going to have such an increase in, 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 in participation there, maybe we can get them to learn about these things there too. So that's my humble, um, you know, not request because it's fine. You know, urban fine, urban farming is fine. I just, I feel like we need to teach kids at some point, these things. I mean, we already have the state telling us, oh, personal and economic finance, you have to teach these things. Um, and maybe if we can catch them in, in another way, in another creative way on these other issues, they, maybe they could learn about how to do their own laundry or, um, you know, I just don't, I think that those are valuable skills. And honestly, I just have a hard time sometimes reminding myself to teach my kids to do that. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So, um, couple questions again, I'm so sorry. It's all about Buford. Um, <laughs> and cause again, uh, these are just, so, there's just a lot of changes. Um, so that's why I have these questions. Um, but the earth science, is that no longer a SOL test? Not at the middle school. Right. Oh, are we middle. offering it at the high school? I think so. I think it's offered as an elective. Dr. Rosario would probably speak to that. Uh, earth, the, the SOL earth science, we don't, uh, our freshmen take biology. Uh, now at the high school. So they go from uh, biology to chemistry. And then from there, they branch out into, into their different subject areas. Okay. So what is the distinction between earth, like life science? Is that a high school credit class? We offer life science here at the seventh grade. Physical science is eighth. And each grade would have their own respective SOL. Okay. So, his so why are we getting rid of earth science? Earth science was a course that historically had been offered at the high school as an elective. And so in order to provide students um, the option for a high school credit course, um, it was um, taught here at Buford for a number of years. But then the division realigned um, its, its scope and sequence. Um, we found that um, students weren't necessarily exposed to the depth of science knowledge that really reflected um, the rigor that we'd like for them to have, um, which really prompted us to realign with the state's vision of life science being a seventh grade SOL, um, physical science being an eighth grade SOL, and putting earth science back in the high school as an elective. As the state has realigned its scope and sequence, then school divisions make adjustments and realign their scope and sequence. And that's what you see happening here. There, at one time, the state's alignment um, had most middle schools offering earth science at the middle school level. And over the past uh, two to three years, the state has moved away from that, that pedagogy and now aligns uh, better with the life sciences and the physical sciences at the elementary school going up into uh, the chemistries and physics at the high school. So that's why we're making the switch to that change because of the scope and sequence at the state. I guess it just feels like um, there's a distinction um, that, again, like some kids might really benefit from having and learn loving, you know, I, I don't know what the curriculums look like. This is not what, but I am. And, you know, so I, I, I just have a uh, nostalgic appreciation for earth science as a, somebody who took it in ninth grade. Um, and I worry that we're just getting rid of it and that it may actually be a pathway for some students to learn and love science in a way that they had not before. Um, that maybe the kind of more generic life and physical sciences will not. So it's kind of more of an exploratory rather than SOL or um, alignment. So I, I would just really question why we're doing that, getting rid of a whole area of science that is, um, because it, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> so I, that is worrisome to me. Dr. I, it's not in the high school listing anymore. Is that correct? Our current pathway right now is uh, biology is usually what most of our freshmen take. And then they move on from there. We have environmental science, AP environmental science, 
astronomy, but it is not a course that we offer as part of our normal uh, course sequence at, at the high school. We moved away from that probably about two years ago. Um, it is still, um, you know, it is still a Virginia course. Uh, it's just not a natural uh, flow into our uh, science pathway at this point. Um, when the state more aligned with more of the life sciences, it makes more sense for us to, to go from biology. And then from there, our, our sciences do diverge into a lot of different areas. Um, for example, forensic science, um, uh, biology two, chemistry, you know, so we, ha we have a lot of options. Um, and right now, earth science is not one of the uh, courses that we offer in a traditional sequence. Right. Okay. Now I remember, Jennifer, I, I hear what you're saying um, and agree. I, I do recall um, when my kiddo was at Buford though, and, and we had to make that decision um, being strongly encouraged um, or encouraging her to, to go the, maybe it was physical science. I don't know. Just those routes as I knew, as they said, it would really prepare her for the labs um, and those types of um expectations you know once they got into the biology and the chem and those types of things but i didn't realize um, it wasn't going to be listed anywhere miss well. mckeever we'll, we'll be glad to bring uh, nigel uh, standage to our next board meeting um, before the board takes action on this to give you a, a fuller explanation of why we're going in this direction not nigel's our science coordinator um yeah i mean i Again, I'm sure there's some logic to it. I just don't see it at the moment again. And that's partially my fault for not having looked at the thing earlier today. So I was just surprised to see that. So I'm not sure that Mr. Sanders needs to necessarily come, but we'll, we can talk about it more um, in the coming weeks. Um, and I just want more, one more explanation about the algebra collapse at the Buford as well and what that means. So the way the program of study was um, um, captured previously is that we had an Algebra 1-7 class and an Algebra 1-8 class. We actually have seventh graders and eighth graders who are both taking Algebra 1 together. So the collapsation is just a, a matter of um, semantics. Great. That's easy enough. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. And so yeah, I think that I one one other thing that I wanted to mention is just uh, I thought you know I think that uh, the vision for the teacher program is great. I'm super excited about that as well um, for our hopefully growing our own. I know that's a huge concern and interest of ours. So thank you all for going out there and finding a way to make that happen for our students. Um, I believe that's all I have at the moment. Um, for the program of study. So thank you again, Ms. Mitchelson Delorier. I'm so sorry, but you did a great job. I know. Shout <laughs> out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you but, for having me. Thank you. We didn't talk about Spanish though. Is that going to be okay, Dr. Hastings? <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, is there any other questions or comments? Okay. So we'll go to the next item, which is the um, policy revisions. Thank you, Ms. McKeever. Um, we have two policies that we need to bring back to you, um, bring before you um, changes based on uh, legislation that was passed during the last General Assembly session. Uh, so uh, Dr. King, would you present those two policies, please? Yes, Dr. Atkins. Good evening, Madam Chair and school board members, as well as Dr. Atkins. Tonight, I present draft revisions to two current policies for discussion and approval, policy JM, restraint and seclusion, as well as policy KNAJ, relations with law enforcement authorities. You've had the opportunity to look at both policy drafts that are from um, Virginia's um, School Board Association. Both revisions to the current policies are due to updates to the regulations governing the use of restraint and seclusion in elementary and um, secondary schools in Virginia, which become effective January 1, 2021. The changes are aligned with our current practices with exceptions um, to the trainings, which will commence in January. 
So at this time, I will pause um, for question and your discussion. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, Leslie or whomever, can we get at least one of the policies up if we're going to? Um, so why don't we talk about this one first? Okay. Um, is there any questions or comments about this particular one? I have a question. I was um, a little confused, uh, Dr. King. I apologize. When you were saying that it aligns with our current policy, I'm just confused about what is changing um, if it currently aligns. And I apologize. Um, no, um, that's that's no problem. The major updates to the uh, to um, this policy JM is the inclusion of the use of positive behavior interventions and supports um, that focuses on our, our student us respecting students, um, their rights to be treated with dignity. Dignity. Um, we use a multi-tiered systems of support. You've probably recall um, Patrick Farrell as well as Jody Murphy be coming before you, sharing with you. Um, our school practices um, and supportive students of teaching um, and giving strategies to our staff when it comes to um, creative ways and engaging ways to um, to teach um, community within the schools what the expectations are um, to give positive reinforcements to practice and demo of walking in the halls of how we the routines within the classroom and within the schools and I believe some of you have participated in classroom meetings that's a gathering of, of building community and partnerships and trust and relationships within the building and some of you've also probably participated in school-wide um, uh, meetings where um, that have also been captured in photos so those are examples of the supports that we have practiced a number of years, as well as our SEAL program, um, social emotional um, programs that when I say it has aligned, those are our practices and trainings that have occurred um, and been occurring in our school division. Any other questions on this particular policy file JM here? Can't Madam see Chair. you, so you got to speak up. Um, Madam so Chair. Yes, go ahead, Lisa. Um, I, honestly, I don't know if I have questions. I'm just not um, comfortable with this policy at all. I'm not comfortable with the fact that we, you know, potentially would be restraining and or secluding any student. So I'd love to have some more conversation about that. Okay, was that part of our old policy? Is that what, Dr. King? Yes, this is a policy that um, we currently have. And we're just- so Restraint and seclusion is a current policy. Okay. And it's a policy that allowed that, that uh, restraint and seclusion to happen in select cases, uh, not that we were implementing that. Um, and we have um, Katrina Lee, Ms. Lee is here with us tonight also. Um, Katrina, do you want to talk a little bit about um, seclusion and restraint and what we use in lieu of that? Yes, ma'am. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Atkins, thank you. So Dr. King um, was exactly right. We use our CTSS and BTSS so that there's a ways that um, we try not to use restraint and seclusion. However, some in some instances, um, we have uh, procedures and policies in place so that if a student is um, dysregulated, we have the policy and procedure in place so that we can maintain safety for students. And so we have um, our training our training practices that we use the system um, for Charlottesville City Schools is MANT. And we use the MANT system, different school systems use different um, trainings. Um, and that's the one that we have. And the focus of that program is de-escalation. The primary focus, our last result is always for any student, not just a, a student um, with a disability, but for all students. The last resort is to physically intervene um, with any student. So the primary focus is to have a program and to have a procedure in place so that our students, if the intervention is needed, is that we can have a procedure as a school that protects the student um, with, in terms of processes. So, our first go-to is just de-escalation. 
um, and talking um, and working through strategies. So the physical pieces, um, again, that's the last go-to. Um, and if, let's say, a student um, for safety reasons, um, due to their, um, if it's uh, uh, severe behaviors, severe behaviors. Um, however, the school system is a is their perfectly uh, fine environment. This is their least restrictive environment, um, and their needs can be met in the school setting. However, there are there are times when the student may become dysregulated, and so there may be a functional behavior assessment and a behavior intervention plan put in place for the student, and there may be a time where the student is escalated where there may be a, a situation where we have to escort them um, to a space for safety um, for the student. And that will fall under the definitions of restraint um, for the student. So it's not, it's not for, um, for us to enforce holes or truly restrain the student in a way, it's very much for safety for our students. Thank you. Um, what is, so with this uh, updated policy, what is our procedure for parent or guardian notification? Yes, um, there is the notification for parents. Um, we would make the notification, there's a time um, within the training, 24 hours. Um, then we also have documentation within um, seven to 10 days that we would get a written documentation to the parent of the incident. So, I mean, it looked like a lot of that was, was Striked out or struck out. From it, it will be with the because of the this is the revision for the Virginia School Board Association. But it being a part of our um, it will be a part of our regulations. The specific procedures um, for schools to follow and time. So that will be included in that. yes and the times. Ms. Torres, if you go down in that policy, it is put back in the notification of parents. There is a requirement of notification of parents and the documentation, and then the regulation will have the timeline. Okay, right. I did see the provisions they're addressing that. I just didn't see the time included in that, so thank you. Um, what would be helpful for me, um, and I think maybe for the public who's watching, uh, would be to understand a little bit more about the requirements of the new legislation because um, we are aligning this policy with that new legislation. It would be helpful to hear sort of the main um, points, you know, the main issues of in that revision. Somebody could do that, please. Yes. Um the main, uh, it's really, we have had the practices, but this policy, it did not include before um, the information about the positive behavior interventions. It also um, includes training. Um, before what Ms. Lee spoke to was about the MANT training, but the change is that this is a tr initial training that will be for all school personnel. Um, that talk that discusses ways to prevent um, the behaviors so that the need for re, um, for restraint and seclusion doesn't become um, become a need. Um, also, it talks about what the proper use of the restraint and seclusion would be and notification of your administrator as well as your principal. Then there's also another training where I've spoke where Ms. Lee spoke about MANT. That is now considered as the advanced training and one administrator per school building will need that training as well as any special education um, teacher or really or any staff member, I should just say a teacher, any staff member who works with a student who's IEP team or 504 team says that it could be a possibility that restraint and seclusion may be a need um, so that that team, those staff members would have the advanced MAT training. So those are the changes. Are there practices that are now disallowed or uh, forbidden, prohibited uh, in the new legislation? Me mechanical, mechanical restraints um, were in our, in, our, in our current policy and that's and it's no longer in the revisions. And Ms. Lee, do you want to add anything to any of the other uh, exclusions now? I think that covered it well. We have, we, 
and we, we okay. never had seclusion um, rooms and we never used mechanical restraints. So that wasn't something that we had to take out of procedure in our schools. Thank you. Dr. Kraft, we'll be more than happy to bring to you uh, a copy of that, uh, the legislation and the discussion that took that, place. That would be really helpful to be able to look at that. Thank we'll you. send that to the board. Okay, thank you. It's also cost referenced on the, on the policy, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Bryson Morseberger? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. So I see that it's, um, I'm going to ban the words, I'm sorry, before we have a sentence, but go ahead. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Maybe I'm sorry again. What I wanted to say was, um, I'm also serving on the, the safety committee and how we're moving forward with uh, safety in schools, you know, now. And so I would humbly ask that since um, we have another board meeting and we have one in January, before schools would start if we go back. If we could just have a little bit longer with it because some of the things we talk about um, in the committee and some of the things in the policy, I just am not completely like, I, I just need a little more time with it, that's it. And so it would be nice if we could not have to do the action on it tonight, if we could have a, a, a closer review of it. Absolutely, we, we, we would not bring this back to you until later. So definitely, we would not ask you to take action tonight. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, LaShondra. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I, just, I was curious if, if any of this had come up in that working committee. So I look forward to getting an update from you all. So thank you for that. I was, uh, um, can we go to the other policy, which is on, which I think is, so which we want to discuss, which I want to discuss, frankly, um, and is. Does anybody have any questions about that policy specifically? Okay, so this is, um, what changes were made to this one, Dr. King? Yes, um, Ms. Thacker, if you could scroll down. Oh, well, okay. So here, here we are, right here. Um, one more, go back up to page two. <laughs> so where right is there. underlined? Yes, That's where the, the underline page. is. Um, and the change here, because, um, as part of the, of the guidance document, um, if a school board um, has a, a MOU with us with a um, with for SROs, it says that we have to also have um, the MOU has to address the use of seclusion and restraint by law enforcement personnel. And we all um, know that our MOU was discontinued. Um, so that's why it says, says it's any memorandum of, of, if we had one basically, of um, m memorandum of understanding that it would in, um, address the use of seclusion and restraint. Okay, can we go back to the, the family feud style? Thank you. Um, so uh, my question about that is now that we're looking at the policy, I feel like we can make a, other adjustments to the policy if we feel the need to. Um, and I just um, find the language. And so of course, I don't want to make any changes without the safety and security committee's input. Um, but I would love it if they could look at this maybe um, and address some of the concerns. Like again, any way that we can avoid interaction with law enforcement, um, I would like to try to do. And so the, some of the mandatory language in the policy is, you know, if it's reflective of the law and we're required to do it, fine. Um, but I just, I, again, I want to minimize contact between our students and law enforcement at school. Is that all language mandatory from the legislation? It, this um, policy, we, I, I show the updates because it is a current policy, but school boards do not have to or authorize restraint and seclusion. Um, the, we do not have to authorize this, this policy. Um, you, you could say that we just do not do restraint and seclusion. Um, I would want... Um, I'm sorry, I, that's not what I asked. Oh, but oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking more about the language that you're not changing. The other language in the policy. The language in KNAJ. Yeah. 
Ms. So McKeever, what we'll like do is, is I think you're talking about the SROs and relationships with the SROs and, and where it pertains to that. We'll be more than happy to get the um, Security and Safety Committee to give some input on this policy um, and then make some of those recommendations to you. Also run it by legal counsel to make sure that um, we are not taking out parts of this policy that is, is required by law. Yeah, because I see some that are obviously have statute citations and I totally understand that, but then some that are not. And I'm like, maybe we could not have mandatory language there. Um, but yeah, so if we could do that, that would be great. Well, and we'll get the, um, we'll identify the mandatory parts of it prior to it going to the committee. Then they'll feel freer to be able to work with the policy. Yeah, um, Rosa, this is one we're meeting again, I think next Tuesday, I think we had one Monday, but I think it just got canceled, but we're meeting um, um, next Tuesday and, but we're getting into the thick of things and we're coming up with some short term recommendations and some, and then some long term recommendations. So this, this is very timely. So, um, um, and I would also like to see what's mandatory and what's, um, you know, um, so that we know what language and what we have to work with. We'll get it to our legal counsel tomorrow and, and see if they can get a quick turnaround on it for us. Thank you. Thanks, you all. Appreciate it. Are there any? I think the language that we, you know, that is added, which is fine, you know, <laughs> that is not the, that I don't think that's a source of any um, consternation on my part. I just want to make sure that the, that the policy reflects the board's will um, as a whole. Um, is that all the questions that we have for that particular policy? So I guess next month we'll come back and talk about it some more. Yeah, I don't really have a question. And I don't know if this is what you were, some of this is what you were referring to. Um, Ms. McKeever was just that first section where it talks about investigations by law enforcement officers at school, you know, how school resource officers, which obviously our MOU is, is no more occasionally talk with students at school. I mean, so things like that, I guess I would not be comfortable, you know, obviously we don't have the SROs in the building anymore, but I don't, I don't, I would not want that happening just an occasional let's chat about things that might be going on in the community so if we can eliminate things like that out of this policy is that what some of what you were referring to i was speaking specifically about number two and number three which don't have any um on page two don't have any specific um statutes uh associated with them but appear to be mandatory language um so that's so I think between the two of us, we've identified, you know, areas that I think that the committee would be, you know, wise to look at. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So we'll go ahead and go to the um, budget development item on the agenda. Is that reasonable? Thank you, Ms. McKeever. Uh, we're in the process now of collecting uh, information from all of our uh, building stakeholders and our teachers on uh, the budget development process. And so we'd like to review with you and the public uh, the sequence of those events and how we will go about developing the budget this year for the 21-22 school year. Ms. Renee Hoover. And if you turn your mic on for us, please. Thank you. Thank you. I, I forget that all the time. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to review with you the uh, budget development process that we will take for fiscal year 2022's budget. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to remind everybody that the state statute uh, requires the superintendent to put forth a needs-based budget. Next slide. The budget priorities that we will take uh, in this budget and, and focus on is to recruit and retain high qualified teachers and staff. Uh, we want to maintain continuity of the high quality instruction programs that we already have in place. 
and every uh, budget decision will apply a lens of equity. And so the budget timeline that um, we have set out, uh, November's already passed uh, and the, the budget calendar was approved and um, budget holders have uh, gotten their operating budgets in and budget requests. Um, this month, we're in the process of reviewing those budget requests and, and compiling that information. And then on the 16th, uh, we will uh, come to you in a work, budget work session to review the uh, data from the state and enrollment and, and demographics that we're seeing that will affect this budget. In January is the heavy lifting uh, month. There will be lots of uh, meetings uh, with our stakeholders, the PTO and, and TAC and budget work sessions. Um, I'll remind everybody, we will have our Saturday work session on January 16th, and this is where we'll present our changes um, to the uh, budget and, and budget request. And then in February, we will we'll finalize the uh, budget and present the superintendent's proposed budget and hold a public hearing, and then the school board will vote on that budget. And then March is where we take our uh, budget and present it to the city council. And it will be in the city council's hands for, for adoption in April. And if there's any questions, oh, I'm sorry, last slide. Um, th these are just key dates. Uh, I wanna uh, remind everybody on uh, December 16th, we will have our budget work session uh, and then yeah, January, you see we'll have our regular meeting on the 7th where we'll bring back any updates. And then we will have our Saturday uh, budget work session where we'll present our changes and budget requests. And then on January 28th, uh, we will have our joint meeting with city council. And that, that concludes the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, can you remind us again what those three prior priorities that you said were n without bringing up the sheet, just remind us, well, you can bring up the sheet, but. Um, we want to retain and recruit qual um, qualified staff, and we want to maintain uh, the continuity of our instructional programs. And we want to look through uh, our budget requests and our budget decisions through the lens of equity. Great, thank you so much. Any questions about the budget development process? Um, I don't have a question, just a, you know, a comment that, you know, I'm, I'm glad that those are the three focus areas. I, I thought for sure one of them was going to be like, just maintaining what we have because we, you know, because of the um, budget, you know, for the city government and actually the, the country and the state, not knowing what, um, monies will be available, um, you know, I think one of those bullets should be, let's try to just, at least for this year, or maybe for the next couple of years, just try to maintain what we have gained over the last few years, because, you know, I, I haven't really read too much to see how much, you know, what the city forecast is going to be with their budget, but I think that's something we really need to really be doing some lobbying, you know, at the state, um, I'm sure every locality will be doing that, um, but um, uh, I think that that's, that will be, as you develop in your budget, Rosa, just, you know, I just don't want you, you to come or with working with staff to come up with a lot of new initiatives. And, you know, then you talk to city government, they're like, you know, we may not have any new funding this year. So, I mean, you've done a few budgets, so you probably know these things. I just you know, um, I'm glad that those are focus areas, but I wanted to, to um, be cautious of the environment that we're in. Thank you, Arya, appreciate that. Any other comments about the budget development process? Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of follow up to what um, Mr. Wade was saying, and particularly because we were talking about the priorities are the 
um, the recruiting and retaining. And I wanted to make sure that we revisit the instructional assistance in the elementary Spanish program, um, that it doesn't, um, because we were talking about looking at the budget this year when we were talking about the programs the last budget cycle. And so I just wanted to kind of add that to it so that we can keep it on the table to discuss. And that was it. Thanks. Yeah, I would just mention too that, um, you know, the General Assembly will be meeting shortly. And I think it's, I did hear um, our delegate uh, Sally Hudson uh, say that her highest priority was funding for public education. And um, I think it really is important for all of us and for, for our, our community to um, reach out and make sure that um, our legislators are aware of our situation and our needs um, in this process. It's, it's really important. And I guess we also will be awaiting the governor's budget. I, I forget exactly when that is, but it's like in February or January when that comes out. The governor will present his budget on December the 15th. Oh, okay. And then it'll be released to the Department of Education so we can start working with our revenue numbers later in the week. Okay. All right. That's soon. <laughs> Okay, well, um, since that's uh, all we got about the budget development, then we can move on if that's okay with the board. We have um, any responses to the student mobility and SPED report? Those are on our um, electronic school board, if anybody has any curiosity about those they are there they are there um hearing no um questions or comments about those i will move on to comments from the public school board uh, welcomes members of the public to um comment and this is your second opportunity of the meeting and if you would like to comment please raise your hand um, or once the message opens up, you message us um, and Mr. Cuomo will put you in the queue. Um, and you have three minutes to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. And anybody like to speak? Anybody in line, Mr. Cuomo? Uh, right now there are no attendees with their hand raised and there are no chat messages indicating that they would like to speak at this time. Okay, we'll give it. We'll give it a minute. Um, we'll give it a minute. If anybody would like to have the opportunity to make public comment, this is your time. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment at this time, and. Um, move on from there to comments from the board. Who would like to go first, if anybody? Dr. Kraft, did I see your hand? Well, I don't know. I was sort of waving around <laughs> randomly, <laughs> but I guess. Um, well, uh, it's just a couple of things. Um, uh, one is that, that something that I've been wondering about, um, I know as uh, we've started to have some students, um, some of the student athletics uh, sports programs um, uh, happening or resuming, um, and uh, which I think is good. Um, I'm also wondering about uh, our ability to have our some of our performing arts students um, in, in band and orchestra be able to actually rehearse in some kind of a, you know, socially distanced manner. Um, it seems like there are other other groups that have been able to um, to do that, and uh, I, you know, it seems to me that there might be a way that we could actually do that and let the students um, uh, be able to uh, play as they're 
you know, as they're meant to play in proximity to each other. So I would just encourage us to find ways to allow that to happen. And, you know, if kids are playing sports, then it seems to me that kids also should be able to play their instruments um, in, again, in a safe and socially distanced manner. So I'm just hoping that uh, somehow that will happen. Um, and uh, the only other thing I want to say, just for myself and just to put it out there, we're not talking about this today, which is good, but in terms of our return to learn, um, that I'm still personally really hoping that we can uh, move toward our, um, our plan, our return to learn hybrid in-person plan. Um, and, you know, our division has done uh, you know, such a good job in setting high standards and creating safety conditions. And I really feel like our kids uh, really need this. And so um, I just want to put that out there that that's kind of where I am. And I, of course, we're going to look at the health and safety data, um, you know, as we see it and things are very scary right now, but I'm hoping that we find a way to um, continue to move forward with that. Um, and that's all, Madam Chair. Thanks, Dr. Kraft. Um, any other comments? Uh, Ms. Bryson Westberger? Um, just to add on, since Dr. Kraft um, got the ball rolling on our back to school plan, um, I was just wondering if for the next meeting, and I'm sure it'll be part of the discussion, but um, we can discuss and hone in on what our local numbers, you know, we were saying we would develop a threshold for what our local numbers would look like um, if we needed to go back virtual. Um, that would be helpful. Um, and mostly I'm asking because um, from what I read, it seems that a, a lot of the restrictions from the governor are restrictions that were part of phase three, except for the school type restrictions. Um, and so it would just be helpful to know because uh, when we were in phase three previously, um, child care centers and things like that um, weren't open or they had to adjust their capacity. And so any additional information we could have on that um, to help like the nonprofits that are um, that are providing virtual uh, instruction or helping the kids with virtual instruction, it would be helpful for them to know like when we pivot and how we're going to pivot as much information as we could have at the next meeting. That would be helpful. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Lisa? Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, along similar lines, I was curious, um, and I don't know if, if Dr. Atkins later wants to speak a little bit about, or if you know yet kind of what we can expect um, on the 16th, um, speaking specifically to the return to learn, but I'd love to, to see if we could um, extrapolate the numbers, the positive, the local numbers um, and, and take out the UVA testing and the UVA positives. <laughs> Dr. Baptist is shaking her head now. Um, just Did you see the I email exchange that between me and um, Dr. Lerdau? Because um, he does his own ca calculations. Um, and so he had, you know, he suggested that it wasn't that complicated to do such a thing. And I don't know how accurate any of these numbers are, but I don't, how is he getting to, I think he's just using the taking the UVA numbers and subtracting them from the TJHD numbers. Is that right, Lisa? That was my understanding, if I recall. But I just felt like it, it gave a more accurate reflection of what is going on locally. And, and um, you know, I mean, UVA is, is UVA, and I think it really um, skews the numbers, um, in my opinion. So that was just a question. The other thing I was hoping um, is and we've asked a couple of times, and if we're getting closer to this potentially, is to really have a better idea or sense, if at all, of what a day in a classroom might look like at the different levels. I really feel like it's important um, for me to know, but for parents in the community to get a sense of, of you know, 
kids enter the building and, and what's going on and what type of movement, if at all, is going to be happening. And I realize that this might be different um, building to building um, and, and totally respect that. But, but I think that could be really telling. Um, and, and along those lines, I mean, I, I do have concerns and, and I guess I'm not feeling um, as much as I would love for our kids to be back face to face and for COVID to just be non-existent. That's, that's not our reality. And I am concerned about the mental health um, implications um, when our kids do come back to school in this modified and, and sterile um, environment and, and really trying to weigh that. I mean, these are the things that I, I think about and I worry about all the time. And, and um, you know, potentially, and again, I know this is all potentially, but if we open and then we have to close and what that does to you know, students, to families, to teachers, um, to prep time. I mean, I just think this, I mean, we've had these conversations, but as we get closer, I mean, there's just the weight of these things, um, I think are huge. Um, so I would love to, to know what it might look like, you know, in an elementary school classroom, what that day might look like. Um, you know, are there going to be times where they can go out for recess, um, specifically for our students who have um, specialty people pushing in um, to work with them, our special education kids, are they going to be able to move from classroom to classroom? Are the people that need to work with them um, going to be able to come into the classrooms? I mean, are the, you know, what, what parameters and, and limit, limitations and restrictions um, are, are going to be in place. And again, I understand it might be different building to building, but I think it's important to, to know and have a sense of, of um, how those services will be provided to these kids, you know, for equity and, and to maximize their instruction. Um, again, I'm, I'm concerned um, a little, a little bit, a lot of bit, you know, about just the, the mental, um, well-being of our teachers, and, and I'm going to keep saying this because I'm concerned for all of us as we all have to deal with this um, and, and what kind of supports we can do for them. And, and it really is important to me that we are not asking them to do more um, than what they are already doing um, and, and not adding new things onto them. Um, so enough of that. I, I did want to make a comment that we um, did have an attempt at a, a SEAC meeting, a special education advisory committee meeting a couple of weeks ago. And I think there was some glitches and maybe the communication um, to the community um, that that was happening. And I know that um, Ms. Lee is, is working with people to try and um, reboot that so that we can hold that meeting again. But I just wanted to let people know to, to please keep an eye out um, to email, to Facebook, to Instagram, um, maybe Twitter. I'm not sure how many uh, avenues will be blasting that out, but um, it is important that we that we um, uh, you know get these meetings um, advertised appropriately. And I know she's working on a great new resource, kind of a quick link um, um, of new resources for families. Um, that we'd like to blast out and share and then hopefully get on our, our um, main school page. So, and I think that's it. So thank you. Anybody else have anything to say? Yeah, I just had a couple of things to go over. Um, um, I, I was happy to hear that Lauren Duggar will be the Emily Carrick Scholar representing Charlottesville High School. So um, I know this is a very early stage in that. So I wanna wish her well for that. And I mentioned this before, but the safety, um, Lissandra and, and I serve on that safety and security meeting um, um, task force. And we have been meeting um, several times with that group. And it's a phenomenal group of, um, of um, committee members that have volunteered for that. And, and Kim and, and her staff is doing a great job of pulling together all of the information for the questions and things and information that we have requested. So. I want to um, thank her um, for that. That's uh, I think that we're really delving deep into some issues and and questions, and I think it's it's going well. Um, um, I'll be attending the KTech meeting next week, and so 
Um, the, the business of the school system is still going on virtually. Um, um, some important decisions to make there. And also um, um, in along the lines of what um, Lisa was talking about as far as um, the mental health of um, everyone involved with going, what's going on here. One of the things that um, staff is doing is that they having a, um, I think I'm getting it right, a day of play or play day on um, this um, Saturday where the students and staff has so many different activities that they can do um, to um, just to get out and, and play and jump and dance and, and help others. It's a lot of different things and they can win some prizes as well. So, and this is all done um, with some help from the Education Foundation. So thank you, Leah, <laughs> for your help on that committee. So that's all that I have and, and um, thank everyone for their help and, and just be safe. Mr. Bryant. First, before my question, I just wanted to give a shout out to Neely Minton. Um, she invited me to be a, a panelist. Uh, it was a discussion on reframing the narrative teaching and leading for equity and justice on the 30th of November. So Dr. Um, Hassan Jeffries um, moderated the panel and Dr. Derek Aldrich was the scholar panelist. So it was a great group of people from all over the state of Virginia sharing our experiences as educators from segregation. Of course, I came in the desegregate, desegregation part of the teaching experience. So it was really nice and um, it could have gone on for hours and hours and hours. So I do appreciate her asking me to serve on that panel. It was a great experience. I was a little nervous at first, but it ended up being a great experience. So I just wanted to give her a shout out. Um, I just had a question about the 16th. Are we, uh, December, we doing a works, a budget work session? Is that early in the day? Four o'clock. Okay, and then we go right into our regular meeting um, in regards to reviewing the metrics as um, to determine whether we move forward to transition to the hybrid the learning. I think it's all the same, isn't it? Are we, I mean, we're just doing a work session that involves two, two topics, one being the budget and one being um, return to school, return right, to right, learn data. Return to learn. Okay, so it's all in one meeting. Okay. Yeah. And it'll be other. published as, yeah, just a regular public meeting because we expect, pot potentially expect action, maybe. I mean, okay. or at least give us that option. Okay, then. So I just, okay, I want some clarity on that. Um, other than that, I don't have any further questions at this time. Thanks, Mr. Bryant. Ms. Breyer? Um, Mr. Wade, it's a day of play uh, from uh, PEF. Um, I would like to thank Paula Culver Dickinson for her work with our uh, physical education instructors and our coordinator for uh, health, fitness, and wellness, if that is the correct title. And if it's not, it's okay. You all know what I'm talking about. Uh, and as you know, normally in November, we host a uh, 5K event uh, through uh, PEF, but because of COVID, we weren't able to do that this year. We also were not able to do our STEAM camp that we do um, at UVA. And so everyone kind of thought it would be nice to do some type of activity get us up and moving. And as you know, the Public Education Foundation is just what it says. It is the Public Education Foundation, but it does things for students. That's the purpose. Monies raised go back to the municipalities for student activities. Um, this year, uh, PEF also made donations to the city and county school divisions because we had some needs due to COVID. And so each of the school districts did receive money uh, and we um, uh, acknowledged that last month with the money that was given to the CACF fund for the city schools and all of the work that the parents had done. Um, Mr. Wade is correct that um, the city school division never sleeps. Every committee 
that all of us are on has continued to meet virtually. And so there are some days that we start Zoom early in the morning. There are some days we start Zoom in the middle of the day or late in the evening. But every committee that all of our board members have been assigned to have continued to meet. That is over and above the committees that Dr. Atkins and her team felt were needed as it relates to safety and security, as it relates to history and the naming of things, as it relates to the COVID committee. And so I would like to thank not only my fellow board members, but all of the people in the community that have risen to the occasion for whatever we have needed. Um, we may be a small school division, but we are a mighty school division. And I attended, as did many of us, the VSBA uh, workshop and Dr. Atkins <clears throat> and your team. A lot of the things that other school divisions are just starting, we've been doing for a while. So evidently we are being watched and people are beginning to take notice. And it is very nice to see how all of us uh, from different backgrounds and different ethnicities and different experiences can come together to do what we are supposed to do, educating our children. But we educate our children not in exclusivity. We're also educating our parents and all of us that are part of this district continue to learn. It has been an honor and a privilege for me to continue to learn about education in order that I grow and in order that I do the job that I have been hired to do at the University of Virginia to the best of my ability. And so I look forward to all of our continued uh, challenges because those challenges make us better. And those challenges allow us to do what everyone says we're supposed to do. Think outside of the box to educate all children and their families to the best of their ability. Thank you, Ms. Perrier. Is there somebody else? Okay, I don't see you, so I'm gonna go talk. Um, so I wanted to say, let's see, um, mention the Trailblazer Day, which was last month. I failed to mention that at the school board meeting last time, um, which I think it was actually on Trailblazer Day. Um, Again, because I get sometimes the privilege of listening in to my kids' classes, um, hearing about our local trailblazers and kind of how that's come to fruition over the past two years, it was just really special to me to, to, to kind of understand the history um, and then to see it being performed right there. And uh, again, like I said earlier, uh, the children, my children get a lot out of that and are really engaged because they can they know where those places are, they know who those people are, you know, and so it's just really, it was, it was special to me um, to see and to them. Um, wanted to mention two other things. One, uh, I just have an anecdote. Um, I, I have cousins, of course, who are teachers and um, they are in Westchester County right outside of New York. And, um, you know, given some of the situation we have with the seventh to 12th grader virtual asynchronous learning issues, um, I, I thought this was like a interesting, their districts were very interesting to me. And I just wondered um, to what extent we've looked at other districts and what they're doing. Um, my uh, one cousin was um, exposed at school uh, to a student who tested positive for COVID. Um, they, uh, her, it was in seventh grade or eighth grade. Um, and um, the, all of the students walk around obviously with their masks on, but also with their trifold plastic divider thing that each one of them has like their own individual one that they put on their desk, then get taught. Um, and the teacher has one too. The student was exposed to 94 people during the, uh, when she, after she, you know, when, uh, before she tested positive and was quarantined. Um, so uh, they, not one person tested positive from that student's exposure, their exposure to that one student, um, which I just thought was 
you know, amazing, um, great. Um, I don't know what else that they're doing. You know, obviously I can't pinpoint to one thing, but I, I wanted to just suggest, um, my cousin, she teaches at the desk with the trifold. There's a camera facing her. So she's teaching both the um, students virtually and she's teaching the class. Um, and it's not perfect. She's like, I don't know if it's better than all virtual, but the kids are here, it's fine. Um, I just think it'd be very helpful to make sure um, that we are looking at other school divisions that are and what they're doing. Um, because I don't wanna think um, small. I mean, if we're going to do this right, especially for the seventh to 12th graders and the asynchronous learning issue, I, uh, you know, just think more broadly than what our neighbors are doing, um, because there are a lot of districts who are doing things. Um, and again, she, my cousin also mentioned, she's like, they also have to, she expects to be regularly quarantining, but she can do the work at home. She can teach virtually at home and that's what she was expected to do. Um, so thankfully she didn't get ill. None of the 94 people did, which was very, we're all very grateful for. Um, and the family of course is doing well, but um, wanted to bring that up. Uh, and again, there's probably stories like that on the other side. So I don't mean to, um, I just wanna acknowledge that as well. Um, I think it would be very helpful if we could have voluntary um, instrumental music uh, classes on the weekends or outside of school hours. Um, again, one of the, if you can wrestle, I feel like you could probably meet safely and perform in, in, you know, your instrument um, safely. Uh, I, it's just very incongruent to me that we are, the state has prioritized sports when we have actual academic things that also, you know, non-sports going kids could really benefit from um, that could be done actually more safely than sports. Um, so I just really want to encourage um, our um, high school specifically, but other schools also to consider um, voluntary uh, um, orchestra and band practices um, that are safe within the confines of like, obviously all the CDC recommendations. Um, I also think that, uh, we could extend that to engineering and other things. And I, I told, um, I think I mentioned this to somebody today is like basically having little pilot programs within the school to, to tiptoe our way into the in-person model. Um, but that allows for some um, some interaction with our students and teachers and staff to the extent the teachers are willing. Um, I just think that would be very helpful for the mental health of our students. Um, I, I just think that there's some outlets that you, that we, we can point to that really support the mental health of our kids. I think sports is one of them. And I, that's again, very confused about how we're moving forward with sports. Um, as a state, but I just want to put that out there that there are other students who are not involved in sports who could really benefit and we could probably make it very safe for them. Um, yeah, so I think that is, those are my comments reg um, regarding the, um, just those are my comments. So thank you <laughs> for indulging me. I feel like there was something else, but I can't remember right now. Uh, thank you very much. I understand the superintendent gets to speak now. Thank you, Ms. McKeever. I um, want to go over uh, just a little bit about the December the 16th, what we plan to bring back to the board. Um, we, we will be able to bring to the board uh, what the day in a, a classroom might look like at our K-6 level. We'll give you some of that information that principals have been working um, quite a bit with their teams on developing the master schedules. Uh, and they have some parameters within which they're working. So we'll be able to present um, just a skeleton look at uh, how the day would look for the students. We will also bring back uh, the high school secondary teams are working on, um, the board had quite a bit of discussion at the last board meeting about the good parts um, and the benefits of the virtual learning. 
and what families and what students appreciate about the virtual learning. And there's a great deal of concern that when we move into, and if we move into the hybrid model, that we're gonna lose some of that contact that students are having with teachers now. And the beauty of that contact is also concern about the, um, the load that teachers are going to be carrying to have to operate in a virtual environment um, and operate in a face-to-face -face environment. And that's a pretty heavy load. Um, Ms. McKeever talked about, have we talked to other schools? Yes, we have. We've gotten a lot of information from other schools. So the uh, secondary teams are working on and looking at uh, how do we preserve what's good about virtual learning while also creating opportunities uh, for face-to-face -face contact. So I've asked them to be very creative, to think outside of the box, um, and they're working on that now. We will uh, reconvene the COVID advisory secondary work group uh, to uh, pass any of those suggestions by that group and let be vetted with that group prior to bringing uh, the hybrid model for return to learn and any other models that the team will come up with um, to the board. We'll also give you an update on the metrics and give you some of the ways other school divisions are using those metrics along with other indicators in order to make decisions about returning um, to face-to-face uh, -face and making decisions about when they may have to go back out into the verbal, uh, the virtual environment. So we'll bring all of that information back to the board on the 16th and give you a chance to deliberate and um, give us direction beyond the 16th. Next, I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate uh, one of our board members, Mr. Um, Juan Diego Wade at the VSBA conference. Mr. Wade was uh, recognized as the VSBA Advocate for Education Award recipient, uh, and he received that award because of his tireless efforts in promoting public education, engaging with the community around education, and also engaging with individual students and supporting and mentoring students through the educational process. Um, Mr. Wade is known um, by his, his dedication to education, uh, his tenacity, in continuing to support uh, education and to advocate for education. So thank you, Mr. Wade, for all that you, you have done. We congratulate you and we are so proud that you represent the state in the Advocate for Education Award. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Thank you. Now, uh, last month, we brought to you um, a group of our teachers who are working incredibly hard in the virtual environment uh, and creating outstanding lessons for their, for their students, collaborating with their peers, and making the virtual learning process a success for so many of our students. And so we have the Virtual Instruction Pro Award, the VIP Award, and we'd like to recognize tonight another group of our wonderful teachers who will be, or who have received uh, this award. Dr. Odie, would you introduce those award winners? Thank you, Dr. Atkins, uh, Madam Chair, uh, board members, and Dr. Atkins. I come to you again just to celebrate great instruction going on in our schools during this virtual environment. As I shared with you last uh, month, uh, the first month that we implemented the VIP awards, this is an award that is recognized by peers. So fellow teachers or APs or coaches or coordinators are, are recognizing uh, great instruction that is happening during this virtual environment. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, move forward to our first group of teachers for the month of November. Let's see if you move forward one slide. And as a reminder, we do um, ask for the nominations to come in by Thursday of each week so that um, we can uh, get the team together to look at the great things that are being said about each of uh, the, the persons that are being nominated and then share that out on the next Monday. So uh, we have 
first, uh, Kelly Bullock, uh, Pre-K-3 uh, General Ed Teacher at Clark, Stacy Riedel, one of our instructional coaches at Walker, Matt Resnick, a seventh grade U.S. History two, uh, teacher at Buford, and Sienna Washburg, seventh grade reading teacher at Buford. And then we have uh, Margaret Bertram. No picture, but I know that she's doing great things at Walker, special education teacher, fifth grade there. And we have Kelsey Davis, a math specialist at Jackson Via, Grinning Greenfield, kindergarten teacher at Greenbrier, and Catherine Sublet, a school counselor at Greenbrier. And our, our last group for November, uh, we have Lisa Behrman, math specialist at Greenbrier, Liz Dinwiddie, school counselor at Walker, Jody Luce, fifth grade language arts and Virginia studies teacher at Walker, and uh, we, oh, we had a special VIP award. There was a nomination for the entire CCS technology department. Uh, so we certainly wanted to recognize that entire team for all of the work that they have done to help us here at CCS to um, get through any glitches and be able to deliver excellent instruction in this um, really amazing virtual time that we have been able to do for our children. So uh, we, we are continuing. Uh, we, we skipped a week for Thanksgiving uh, with making any announcements for our VIPs. And uh, next Monday, we will be announcing our, our first group for December. So for anyone who is watching, we are still taking nominations of, of great uh, folks that are really putting 500% effort in uh, instruction during this virtual environment. We look forward to recognizing additional VIPs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Odie. Uh, the last update that I'd like to give to the board and the community is that the board heard a report from the technology department about uh, the distribution of devices to our students and also mobile hotspots and routers to our students. And um, the technology department has worked incredibly hard to make sure that there is not only a device in the hands of every student, but the students have access to the internet. So we're very proud to announce that as of today, we have 99.9 .9, and I won't say 100 because there may be one or someone who, who is struggling right now with access, internet access, but we have 99.9% uh, saturation of um, internet access amongst our students. They either have a hotspot. Um, Comcast is one of our partners. T-Mobile is another partner of ours. So it's either a hotspot or a router uh, in order to give them internet access. Um, we've just entered into a new partnership with T-Mobile and some of the hotspots are going to be expiring soon. So we're going to trade those out for the T-Mobile hotspots and we're looking forward to not only uh, the students having that access during the spring, uh, what we'd like to do is see a continuation of that access um, uh, during the school hours and during the summer so that students can continue with their learning. And we will be, uh, we're planning to add a line item in our budget. Mr. Wade, I hope this is our only addition, but we'd like to add a line item in our budget. So this will be a recurring um, uh, endeavor for us. It would be a, a recurring allocation that we have to ensure that our students maintain internet access. Um, and we can see just how important it is and we want to close that gap in our community and amongst our students. So congratulations to the technology team for making that happen. We may be one of the only school divisions in the Commonwealth who has reached close to that 100% saturation with our students. So thank you and thank you to all of our teachers um, and our staff and our support people for all that you're doing right now. Uh, we know that, that you're dedicated and you're wonderful and you're doing everything, all the decisions and discussions and any recommendation that we make will have safety um, of students and staff as a priority in our decisions or recommendations. So thank you, Ms. McKeever. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. 
I um, have been remiss, so I wanted to acknowledge and offer Ms. Kadari an opportunity to speak and comment here and apologize for my failure to acknowledge you earlier. So Ms. Kadari, if you have any comments, this would be an excellent time to, to speak. And I'm sorry to kind of take uh, control of the agenda here, but I'm going to just make this as an extension of the board comments, if that's okay with the board. Ms. Kadari, are you there? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I actually have some students input about um, SROs, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, so um, we sent out, um, we had an online poll that students took and um, it was whether they wanted to keep SROs in schools or not. And um, we basically, we got 50 responses and um, mostly from CHS, but mix of grades. And 32 said yes, and 18 said no. Um, we also had a couple of people who just verbally said it, but couldn't fill out the uh, poll. And um, five were um, wanted that, to keep the SROs and three were against it. And um, if you, so uh, the people who were against SROs said that um, it makes the environment toxic for colored um, students, or in other words, they feel targeted. And they also said that it contributed to the school to um, prison pipeline. And then the people who, um, a lot of students who want SRO said that they feel more. We lost you, Ms. Kadari. The, um, uh, what are we, we lost your audio and now we're losing your video. So um, um, I just wanted to add in that if we could contact her, she could share that information with um, Kim Powell um, and Kim can share it with the committee. And I just wanna add that we also got a, a memo today from the Black Student Union of the high school that um, will also be shared with the um, committee as well. I'm sorry, Ms. Kadari, is there anything you wanted to add now that I see you're a little bit? Um, the only other thing they said that, uh, an interesting point that a few students pointed out that if we do go back to school, it would be helpful to have them uh, to make sure everybody's following like the COVID um, policies. So like keeping masks on and distance. So yeah, that's all. Again, please accept my apologies and thank you for your excellent comments. I will try to remember at our next meeting. <laughs> um, okay, so speaking of our next meeting, oh, we're doing work section wrap up first. Whew. I have a reprieve, go ahead. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, to provide the legislation connected with the policy drafts with the board, as well as to share the attorney reviewed policy with the safety and security committee. Okay, thank you, Dr. King. Um, the next meeting will be December 16th at four o'clock via Zoom. Um, that's going to be a budget work session um, along with um, a work session, I guess, around data and return to learn. Um, and then our next meeting after that will be Thursday, January 7th at 5 p.m. Um, so are there any, anything else I say reluctantly? Um, hearing no objections, uh, we stand adjourned. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate your time. Good night. Good night.